Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm really excited for this discussion about the Old Testament canon, and I'm here with Professor John Mead, and I'll just introduce him very briefly, and then uh, we'll get get right into it. So um, Dr. Mead is an associate professor of Old Testament at Phoenix Seminary, and he really has put out some incredible scholarship related to this topic, in particular the book that will be linked in the video description, there's a 2018 book published by Oxford University Press that he co-wrote called The Biblical Canon Lists from Early Christianity. And then you have another book out on Job. And the only thing I was able to tell about it from the title is that it has something to do with Job. <laughs> so yeah, and thank you for being willing to make the time for this. But let's talk a little bit about the issues of canonization and the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. How have you gotten interested in this? And then maybe can you say anything about why you think this issue is important? Yeah, so I mean, getting into the issue of canon, uh, I like to say that uh, in some ways these issues chose me. There was a lot of uh, Bible college students uh, where I went to seminary at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. A lot of Bible college students asking questions about where we got the Bible from. I had done some reading in that, of course. And so for some reason, I guess I'm the guy in the library or the bookstore or whatever that, hey, you know, John, what do you think about this? And, you know, and some of the questions I didn't have answers for. So I started just to kind of dig and dig and dig in those days uh, for, for answers for how we got our Bible. Kind of combined with, I, I've always loved history. I've always loved kind of how things originated and developed uh, over time. And I've just enjoyed uh, kind of, you know, digging down into certain topics. And, you know, as a Christian, the Bible, of course, is, is central to, to everything, you know, we believe and, 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 and how, we, how we're supposed to behave and act. And so somewhere along the way, I, I don't remember exactly when, I just became fascinated with the, the history of the book itself, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, so my dissertation, as we've just kind of talked about earlier, I mean, it's, it's very much a, a project in the history of the text, the history of the wording of the Old Testament for Job 22 to 42. Um, but the canon question, uh, I think, came a little bit later. I was actually preparing for a course to teach a course on the canon. And I had looked at a number of avenues, but I hadn't, I hadn't even begun to scratch the surface as I, as I look back on it now. Um, and getting into these various canon lists, which we'll talk about, I guess, in a bit, but uh, how, what do they tell us about what early Christians thought, the, which books were in the canon of scripture or not, right, for Old or New Testament even. So once I got into those, um, I, it's been hard to look back because yeah. that's a fascinating study in itself. So yeah. Um, yeah, so, and just, so I guess mainly though, God's people, also just just having questions wanting to mm. know where their book comes from you know right. and uh so yeah it's kind of a lot of different reasons in there i'd say but, yeah. yeah so so give us just a real brief snapshot overview of where some of the disagreements lie among the jewish canon protestant canon catholic canon and then i know there's the orthodox canon and just so people know uh they can in the video description click on your book that you co-wrote, Oxford University Press, 2018, The Biblical Canon List from Early Christianity. We'll get into that book a little more, but maybe just we can start so we don't assume any background information. Give us a little bit of the differences. Yes. So all, all um, Greek Orthodox, uh, Protestants, uh, Roman Catholics, all have the same 27 book New Testament. Okay, so there, there are some Orthodox groups like the Syriac Orthodox today um, that have fewer books in their New Testament, right? They don't have, say, the books of uh, Second, Third John, Second Peter, or Jude. Even Revelation seems to be kind of on the fuzzy edges for the Syriac canon. Okay, but, but I would say it does seem that most Christians across the globe have a 27 book New Testament canon that they, they agree on. But when you come to the Old Testament, uh, this is actually where I think most of the disagreements begin. Uh, let's start with the Jewish canon. The Jewish canon, uh, it has an odd number that we're not familiar with. It has 24 books, 
okay? Uh, our Protestant canon has 39, all right? But the Jewish canon and the Protestant canon actually mirror each other. They have the same contents. It's just that the Jews number certain books, uh, uh, clusters of books as one book. So the 12 minor prophets in our canon are actually one book in the Jewish canon. Uh, all of our double books, like first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, all of these are counted as one book for the Jewish canon. Um, other double books like Ezra, Nehemiah are simply the book of Ezra in the Jewish canon. Does that make sense? Um, mm -hmm. Some early canonical numbers are 22 books because they would double the books of R Judges and Ruth together as one book. And they would also double Jeremiah and Lamentations as one book. So once you actually do all of that kind of subtraction, <laughs> you wind up with 22 books or 24 if uh, Ruth and Lamentations are counted separately. But then if you count all the books individually, like we do in our Protestant canon, you get 39 books total. Okay, okay. so so once they like you get to the make numerical, this confusing for us, don't they? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So it's good just to kind of clear that out of the way first. And okay. so, um, <laughs> but but in terms of contents, the Jewish canon and the Protestant canon actually mirror each other, but they reckon the numbers differently. Hmm. Now, if you start with just our Protestant canon, 39 books, and you add seven to it, you wind up with the Roman Catholic canon. They add. Uh, or, or include Judith, Tobit, Wisdom of Solomon, a book that they call Ecclesiasticus that early Jews might have called Ben Sira or Sirach. Uh, it's the same book, but it goes by three different titles. So yeah, confusion all over the place, right? Um, and then the books of first and second Maccabees. So that's six. And then they add a seventh, uh, Baruch. Uh, and we can talk about Baruch a little bit later, but but Baruch would be the seventh uh, deuterocanonical book uh, found in the Roman Catholic canon. Now the Greek Orthodox canon is, is trickier to define. Um, and I, I think the, the modern Greek Orthodox scholars on this um, are, and, and from my reading, and I, I'm still growing in these areas, uh, but my reading of them uh, shows that they're still wrestling with how scripture and tradition and canon kind of all relate to each other. Uh, you actually don't get um, sort of Reformation era or modern era canon lists for the Greek Orthodox Church until the 16th and 17th centuries. And the way in which this evidence is, is interpreted is that the Greek Orthodox groups are sort of bouncing between Protestant lists, Protestant formulations, where they don't include the apocryphal books, and then Catholic lists where they actually do include deuterocanonical books. So the, 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 the evidence is a bit conflicting, uh, at least from, from where I'm sitting. Um, but I think Greek Orthodox scholars are, are basically, I, I don't know if you can pin them down saying they have a hardened canon of the Old Testament right now. They have to include so many books of their Bible but it's not clear as to what the canon actually is, okay, for, for on, on my reading uh, of, of them. So if you go back to the earlier statements, so there's like a Russian Orthodox catechism, which basically tries to leave the issue with the books that Athanasius and Gregory of Nazianzus and Cyril of Jerusalem defined. Uh, but I get the impression that a lot of modern Greek Orthodox uh, scholars on this question aren't sort of that persuasion. So, so I probably for at least just admitting my own shortfalls in this area, modern Greek Orthodox canon is something we probably shouldn't talk too much about. Okay. Because it's sure. just the more I read it, it's it's going down the going down a rabbit trail uh, yeah, or a absolutely. rabbit hole in, in my mind. So but the other two canons, um, we should definitely talk more about those. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. And and for Eastern Orthodox Christians watching, feel free to leave in the comments your, your observations or, or your input on that. So one of the things we were just talking about is the importance of not caricaturing the other side. And this is something that's a huge value for me with my channel, especially in the Catholic and Protestant dialogue, also Protestant and Orthodox dialogue. And we were just talking about how we share that value. So maybe a good 
starting point could be, what are some of the really simplified views we want to stay away from? <laughs> are there any things yeah. we should be alert to as we get into this, you know, areas where either side might be tempted to oversimplify the other side's perspective? Yeah, great question. So I think, I think there's a couple that we probably need to clear away. So, so I'm a Protestant. I think that's probably clear now. Uh, I'm a Protestant. Um, oftentimes I hear or read in places uh, from Roman Catholic apologists and, and scholars that the Protestants removed books from the Bible or something like this. I, I hope by the end of this segment to show that that's a caricature, that we, we need to leave that behind. Protestants um, actually, in, in my mind, retrieved a very early canonical tradition, as I, as I want to show eventually here. Okay, so, but, so, but I do think that's a caricature that Roman Catholics have to worry about. Now, how have I caricatured the Roman Catholic canon over the years? Uh, in many, many ways. What, but let's, let's start with some of the obvious ones. Um, the term Apocrypha, as applied to those seven books that we talked about earlier, the term Apocrypha, uh, there's actually really no historical evidence. There's one piece, and we'll come to it in a minute, but there's no evidence that early Christians called those books Apocrypha or secret writings, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the term that they used for those books. Um, Jerome, St. Jerome on one occasion, and I'll, I'll unpack this a bit later, but he's the only father I know in the earliest centuries of the church's history that calls those books, including the Shepherd of Hermas, so seven, he calls those seven books Apocrypha, okay? But Jerome also in other places in his writings has a very high estimation of those writings. And he's not trying to disparage them with the term apocrypha, okay? But I think Protestants use that term a lot to try to disparage those works, to try to show them as maybe very unimportant, uh, secret writings, esoteric writings, these sorts of things. Um, the early church, though, as we're going to show, many of them don't include those books in their canon lists. They don't consider them to be apocrypha. They reserved the term apocrypha for books that they considered to be heretical and mm. dangerous. They would call the book the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel according to the Egyptians or the Apocalypse of Peter or something like this. These were apocryphal works, you see. Uh, the, the, the book of Enoch is uh, going to be considered apocryphal, okay? But they're not putting the books of Judith, Tobit, 1st, 2nd Maccabees in the same grouping as the book of Enoch. Those are actually separated out, okay? Um, so, so that should be something that I think Protestants need to be aware of. Let's not caricature those books as apocrypha. The other thing that uh, I have said over the years is that and I've, it's come, I've come to realize it as a total caricature, is that the Roman Catholic Church added these books at the Council of Trent in 1546. This is wrong. <laughs> this is wrong. And, and this is where Protestants need to be more uh, careful and accurate with the information that they share, okay? Uh, what's, hap what, what, what's happened is there are, so, I think, and on my understanding, there are some new things that Trent did, and we'll talk, to, talk about that. But, but those books are added to canon lists that go back to the middle of the fourth century or maybe even earlier. So we have canon lists that are written in Latin uh, that are tied to a manuscript called Codex Claremontinus. And many of those books are included alongside of canonical books, okay? They're considered to be kind of in, all right? There's another book. Uh, or another list called the Momsen Catalog or the Cheltenheim list that also includes these books alongside of the books in the Hebrew canon. And most famously, and this is where I think Protestants are deplorable, <laughs> it, our patron saint, Augustine, includes these books in the canon of the Old Testament. And he, he doesn't apologize for it. <laughs> he just says, they're the books that we read that churches, that, that our churches read and accept as divinely inspired. 
And so there's a couple other early canon lists that do the same thing. So to say that the Council of Trent kind of invented this canon in 1546, that's just about as wrong as saying Protestants removed the books from the Bible, you see. Mm -hmm. What you're gonna find is both groups actually have historical precedent for why they did what they did, okay? okay. And I think that's, we've got to keep that in mind. Neither one is really doing anything 16th century novel. Mm -hmm. Both groups are going back to fourth century precedent, okay? When they do what they do in regards to the canon. Okay, thank you. That That's sense, so, to totally yeah. makes sense. And and let's let's go to those fourth century views next. And I'll just say in passing, thank you for that because this has been actually something that I have felt have come to feel really important is really important and actually just consistent with the gospel that when we make a mistake in the way we characterize someone, just being okay to just say, hey, sorry, I made a mistake, <laughs> and I've done that so right. many times. And I actually, exactly. I actually think the process of searching for truth will probably involve a continuous willingness to do that because just the, the removal of caricatures is somewhat of a continuous process sometimes, at least it is for me. So thank you, that's really helpful. So let's go Sorry. back, give us a, just a quick overview, fourth yes. century and, and views among, because in, in chapter one of the book, the biblical canon list from early Christianity, you review some of these. Give us a little overview of views of the canon among the fathers. Yes, okay. From, from the best we can get, from, from what we can gather, in the earliest centuries of the church, and for our purposes, let's just say like 100 to about 400 AD. That's what we're talking about when we talk about this period of early Christianity. It seems that there were, um, there were criteria in play for whether to consider or acknowledge a book as canon or not, okay? And by canon, God's speaking through this book, right? A divinely inspired book, okay? There were criteria. We, we talk about criteria for the New Testament, but there are also criteria for the Old. A couple of them are really um, uh, important, but we, but we don't need to get sidetracked by them here. There, there does seem that early Christians considered whether a book was written in Hebrew or not to be an important criterion for whether it should become part of the church's Old Testament. Another criterion was uh, like the, the, um, the, the time period at which they thought a book was written would be really important. Uh, this seems to go back to even the, church, the, the Jewish historian Josephus, who said that the, that the books in the Jewish canon all must have been written between the time of Moses and King Artaxerxes, which is basically the time of Esther and Ezra and Nehemiah, okay? So if a book was written in, the, in this time frame, this window, it was good. But if it, was, if it was written before it, like say some, like someone thought maybe the book of Enoch was written before Moses, that would sort of rule Enoch out on the front end. And it would also rule out books like Judith and Tobit and first and second Maccabees that were written after the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, you see. So, so Josephus's canonical window, if you will, was between Moses and the time of Ezra. Well, the church fathers seem to have a similar view of this uh, as well. Uh, so, so language a book was written in and the time at which it was written do seem to be important factors. But the two chief factors, Gavin, and this is where I think the debate comes front and center. There, there were two other criteria. One, was the book in the Hebrew canon? Did the Jews read and accept it in their synagogue? That's criterion number one, major criterion number one. The secondly, and this is where the conflict begins, what was the book uh, read and, and received in Christian churches? <laughs> and um, this, is, this is what leads to, to the debate, I think, are these two criteria that wind up in tension with each other over a select few number of books. So, um, this actually precedes the fourth century. You can look at discussion letters that go back and forth between Julius Africanus and Origen of Alexandria in the third century. Africanus, uh, in arguing that the book of Susanna should not be in the canon. Okay, so Julius is sending a, a, a question to Origen saying, look, it doesn't look like Susanna was written in Hebrew and and chief among Africanus' arguments is 
the Jews don't receive it. And we did not receive it from the Jews, the book of Susanna. And he expects Origen to agree with him on this. But Origen writes a really long letter back and he actually thinks, well, no, Susanna could have been written in Hebrew. So he kind of leaves that as an open question. But Origen mainly comes back and says, look, Africanus, we, this, the synagogue is important, but it's not the final factor. The final factor is what books were given to the church by providence? And he makes a, quite a theological argument. And what books are for our edification? And so edification for the church becomes a major criterion that in Origen's mind trumps the, the Jewish canon criterion. Does that make sense? Or the Hebrew criterion. So you get a little conflict between early Christians on this. Well, now you fast forward to the fourth century. And I think, I think it's the same issue between Jerome on the one hand and Augustine on the other. Jerome in all of his canon lists advocates 100% the church should only have uh, the books in its canon that are in the Hebrew canon. He actually called this the Hebrew truth, you know, the, the Hebraica Veritas. This is whatever is in the Hebrew canon, that is for the church. He, he follows this all the way to its logical end. He translates a new or, or makes a new Latin translation called the Vulgate which becomes, uh, or which was entirely based on the Hebrew text, even. Augustine, on the other hand, when he lists his books and his work on Christian teaching, he lists all the books of the canon. He winds up with 44 books, which include those uh, deuterocanonical or, or, or apocryphal books. And he makes it quite clear that these are the books that the churches have read, and these are the church books that the churches have received. And that's why his list is at odds with Jerome's list, you see. There's two different criteria in play. Mm. Both of them, uh, well, this is what remains to be seen, right? So it seems like someone's making a novel move here. Mm. Someone's making an innovation, but it's not quite easy to determine right off who's doing that. I think both of them would say there's precedent, and both of them would be right, but there's a question of like, how deep does the precedent go? What's the earliest tradition on this? And we can, we can maybe come back and, and answer that question a bit later. But, but I think that's what sets the table, so to speak, for all of the discussions through the Middle Ages and finally what culminates in the 16th century. Okay, that's really helpful. I can already tell this discussion is going to be helpful for people who are engaging this issue and wanting to push in a little deeper. So this is really good. Now, let me mention another article that you've written uh, that's entitled The Septuagint and the Biblical Canon in the book called the TNT Clark Handbook of Septuagint Research. Did you co-write this one as well? Uh, no, this is just my article. This it's is going to be a, a, a book of a lot of different articles on things related to the Septuagint. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So, and I'll put the link to that in the description here, but um, if I understood correctly, you work through 19 lists in the church between 100 and 850 AD. Yeah. And the overall impression is, if I understand correctly, a pretty consistent core. My camera will come right back on, just like to keep people in suspense sometimes. Here we go. Um, a pretty consistent core, but then a little bit of fuzziness too around the edges with books like Esther. Is that an yes. accurate perception from these lists of the Greek Old Testament? Yes, that's right. So, so some have said that um, this is maybe another misnomer in this whole discussion that the Catholic Church just accepted the canon of the Septuagint or something like this. Well, there, there's really no canon of the Septuagint, but we don't need to get distracted by that question right now. What those, what those Greek Christian canon lists show, those 18 or 19 from 100 to about 850 AD show, is that um, with, with rare exception, do you get any of the deuterocanonical books listed? Okay, so that there's, they're actually fairly consistent on not including deuterocanonical books amongst the canonical books. And that is these lists are firmly anchored to the Hebrew canon, okay? 
that was a surprise to me when you dive into that evidence. But how do I know that they're tied to the Hebrew canon? Well, several of them make explicit reference to them having the same number of books as the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and many of these canon lists have only 22 books, right? Because we, how we talked about how they number books uh, earlier in this segment here, right? There's, they number books, uh, double books as one, all these lists count the 12 minor prophets as one book, but, but the whole list of, say, Athanasius of Alexandria is entirely Hebraic, right? Except he doesn't include the book of Esther. And he and Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, another chap by the name of Amphilochius of Iconium uh, in the fourth century, those three don't include the book of Esther. And then there's a second century canon list by Melito of Sardis. He also doesn't include the book of Esther. But most of them do include the book of Esther. And, uh, and when, yeah, so, so those lists show that throughout the, the, er, the, the history of the, of the church, uh, the earliest history of the church, because 12 of those lists, Gavin, are actually dated to before 400, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so out of the 19, 12 of them are from this earliest period, and they all reflect the Hebrew canon by and large. Some omit Esther, but none of them include the, the deuterocanonical books. That's the biggest piece. Now, some of them do include reference to Baruch. Some of them might include reference to um, yeah, some of the additions to Daniel or something like this. Uh, but it seems like the reason for that is they're tied to the book of Daniel. They're tied to the book of Jeremiah. They're not really thinking in terms of Baruch being a separate book. Hmm. Okay. Baruch, in fact, in the city, in Augustine's City of God, he even mentions this problem where you can get citations to the book of Baruch attributed to Jeremiah. And that's because many of the ancient authors thought that Jeremiah wrote the book of Baruch, you see. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, you, we'll, well, I'm sure we'll come back to this too, but none of these deuterocanonical books are cited as scripture in the first, or sorry, in the second century. AD by by early fathers with two with two exceptions Irenaeus cites Baruch twice but always but in both cases he attributes it to Jeremiah because Irenaeus thinks that Baruch is actually a part of the book of Jeremiah okay because there's some textual issues that haven't been sorted out yet by early Christians you have to wait till after Origen for them to actually be able to tell what belonged to the Hebrew version of Jeremiah and what was part of the Greek edition. Okay, so, so that's why it might seem. But Augustine actually says most people cite Baruch as according to Jeremiah, and he's right about that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. So um, I forget where we were. <laughs> oh, that's good. I think that, so you've given, I can't remember if you gave the second exception. You said there's two exceptions, I think in the second century, you mentioned Irenaeus. Oh, no, Irenaeus is both of them. Both of them, yeah. Irene, Irenaeus. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. That's helpful. Okay. So let's talk about this issue of citations. You know, one of the criteria that yes. sometimes comes up is if a particular book is cited in the New Testament, or if it's not cited, arguments will be made for or against a book on that basis. But this is very slippery. Um, because as you've pointed out, you've got Tertullian arguing that first Enoch is uh, canonical because it's quoted in Jude, but then you've got other books like Esther that aren't quoted. So how do we know when a quotation of a book is relevant to its canonicity and when it isn't? Yeah, so, so most canon scholars rank the usages of a book. So, so, you, can get, so you get explicit citation usually with a formula like the scripture says, or it has been written. And then usually, you know, you get a following citation or something like this. Uh, the New Testament is filled with these, right? Um, even, even with its, you know, so that what was spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled, right? These are, these are clear ascriptions to divinely inspired scripture, right? Then you can get kind of quotations, which are, there's usually a subtle difference between like an it is written versus maybe a it says, okay? Something like subtle, this is very subtle. 
Sometimes canon scholars might be a little too in the weeds on this, but you get an it is written versus an it is said. And then the last level is going to be like an allusion to a book where they don't, they don't introduce it with anything, but they're going to use similar language or verbiage. So um, probably, probably the best example of that um, in, in the New Testament, I mean, Hebrews chapter four, um, to my, in fact, let me just back up. To my knowledge, the New Testament nowhere cites the book of Joshua as scripture, okay? There's never like an it is written or it says, followed by a scriptural text of Joshua. You just don't get it. But you turn to Hebrews 4 and you open that up and you go, oh, if Joshua had given them rest, right, there would no longer be a day right, in the future, right, today, right, the, the author's unpacking Psalm 95 in relation to the book of Joshua. Well, that's a, that's what we would call an allusion, right, or a mention of the book of Joshua. He's not citing it as scripture, but, but anyone who's reading Joshua 21 uh, knows that, that Joshua did give them rest, but Psalm 95 comes around later and says, well, it didn't, right? So, 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 so the author is alluding to Joshua and a lot of things within that book, but nowhere in the New Testament is Joshua cited as scripture. Canon, canon scholars make a big deal out of this, out of this distinction. Um, clearly, they know of these books, but they don't always cite them as scripture. So we just need to be honest that a lot of the history books in the Old Testament aren't actually cited as scripture in the New Testament. They're just not. Uh, Esther is probably the biggest kind of example, but, but even a book like Joshua is not. Mm -hmm. But how much, how much of, you know, what should we make of these allusions? I don't know. I go to Hebrews 11 and near the end of the hall of faith, right? Uh, you get the author talking about uh, Jews, uh, pious Jews being commended for their faith, who were tortured, who were hiding in caves, right? Mm. Uh, and the language there, especially the tortured language, comes right out of 2 Maccabees 6 and 7. It's one of the strongest allusions in the New Testament to a so-called deuterocanonical or apocryphal book. But he nowhere cites the this is the book of Maccabees as scripture, you see, but it's an allusion to this. So most scholars see if, if an author is citing something as scripture, that's the highest level of estimation he can give, okay? Allusions can show awareness of a book, but we still don't actually know from an allusion where or what, what estimation of that book is being made, right? It's positive, right, usually, but is he actually thinking about that book as canonical or not? Let me fast forward uh, a little bit in time. There's no question that um, some of the early church fathers allude to these apocryphal books. We can see it uh, in 1 Clement 55. You know, this early letter of Clement to the Corinthians written around 95 AD in chapter 55, he alludes to the um, piety of both Esther and Judith. These are kind of like examples of piety for women, you know, and it's, it's this really powerful chapter in 1 Clement. Um, but he nowhere calls Esther or Judith as scripture. So, but he is making use of the book. He is alluding to various events in their lives but he, and he's setting them up as a, as a model of piety. But what's interesting is that he nowhere calls it, calls them scripture. So most scholars look at that and say, Clement's not really giving us evidence to be able to say Esther or Judith is considered canon at this time. Okay. Important. Yes. Canon, not necessarily. Okay. So, so the distinctions are pretty fine here. Mm. Even as you continue in time, uh, Athanasius, for example, and this is, this is, I think, important. Athanasius quotes books like Wisdom and Ecclesiasticus, Wisdom of Solomon and Ecclesiasticus, 
he actually quotes them as among the scriptures. He will actually say they are graphi or scriptures. But when it comes time for Athanasius to list the books that are in the canon, interestingly, he does not include wisdom and Ecclesiasticus amongst the canonical books. Hmm. Well, yes. In, in early Christianity, there, is, there are tiers of spiritual literature. You have canon. Uh, Athanasius describes these as the sources of salvation. This is where doctrine comes from. On the far end of the, uh, uh, of the spectrum, he has the apocryphal books. Hmm. But Athanasius has a middle category of books. He calls them the books that are able to be read. And this is the, these are books that explain piety or illustrate true religion for early Christians. They're not, they're not canonical, but they're not heretical either. And this is where he puts the books like Wisdom and, and Ecclesiasticus. And what that does for us, I think, is shows that a church father can even cite something as scripture, but he might just be referring to books in the middle category and not the books in the canonical category necessarily. You actually need the canon list to be the interpretive key for which books are establishing doctrine and which books are just illustrating piety to mm -hmm. other new, new believers or new converts. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, as if it wasn't already complicated enough, right? Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So more caution is needed with the illusions. Right. Oh, yeah. Illusions, I think at best, and mo I think most scholars would agree with this, illusions show us that an ancient author is aware of another ancient book or work, but, but it's not really giving us their estimation of that book, okay? Yeah. Only a citation that calls it scripture uh, or divine or, or holy scripture can actually give us some indication, you see, of what an author really thought. That's why Protestants, let's just put, pull it back to this point. That's why Protestants make a big deal out of apocryphal books not being cited in the New Testament, mm -hmm. right? They, they're, we, we need to be honest, they're alluded to, mm -hmm. but they're not cited as scripture mm -hmm. like um, a vast majority of the proto-canonical books are, like the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms right? Uh, even in books like Job and Proverbs, I mean, they're cited as scripture in the New Testament writings, but the book of Judith is never cited uh, as scripture uh, in the New Testament. So, so I still think it's an important distinction. Mm -hmm. We just need to be clear about two things, the Protestants, that is. The, the New Testament authors don't cite every book in their canon as scripture. They mm -hmm. cite a lot of them, but not all of them. And we need to come back and clarify that, that although uh, the New Testament authors allude to all of these books, they also allude to more than the proto-canonical books. They allude to some of the deuterocanonical books as well. So whatever kind of weight you're putting on deuter uh, or upon allusion, you have to apply and extend that to every book that's alluded to. Yes, so that's, that's helpful. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. So um, as we near the end here, let's talk a little bit more about the Council of Trent. And you've mentioned this a little bit earlier, but let's circle back and dig into this a little more. To what extent is the Council of Trent and its uh, canon list uh, simply reaffirming earlier decisions? And are there any ways that it's doing something new? Yeah, good. So from the documents that come out of Trent, um, and, and maybe we should put a link to an article that I've found very helpful on this. Um, I, I, I will. Below, yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you. But um, so, so according, according to the things I'm reading, Trent, uh, Trent had three major issues regarding the biblical canon. Number one, uh, they, they did wrestle with whether to keep a distinction between these books or not. We talked about Athanasius's distinction of canonical books and books to be read. Jerome had, had, had the same distinction, but he put it this way. There are, these, there are these canonical books, which are books that we base doctrine upon. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And then there are these other books that are good for the church's edification, but we don't base doctrine on them. Going into Trent, you, there, there is no Roman Catholic view on this before 1546. So I can look at the Catholic scholar Erasmus of Rotterdam, and Erasmus is still asking about the distinction, and he realizes that the distinction creates a different weight between the Pentateuch and the four Gospels and books like Wisdom, Sirach, and Tobit, you see. This is Erasmus in the 1520s and 1530s. Mm. Cardinal, Cardinal Jimenez was one of the grand inquisitors of the Spanish Inquisition, put together a massive Bible called the Complutensian Polyglot. In his preface to the reader, this is dated to 1517, in his preface to the reader, he cites Jerome and says, only the books that have a Hebrew column are the books that are rightly in our canon. There are other books to be sure, but these books are actually given for the edification of the faithful, not for the establishing on, of, of sound doctrine. Hmm. That's Cardinal Himenes, okay? Uh, in his view, if you keep going in the 1530s, Cardinal Cajetan, famous cardinal, actually reviewed the life and doctrine of Martin Luther in 1518 at the, at the Diet of Augsburg. This Cardinal Cajetan lays out his view of the Old Testament canon at the very end of his commentary on all of the history books. Cajetan says, um, I, 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 I'm not including first and second Maccabees and Tobit and Judith or wisdom and, and Sirach or, or Ecclesiasticus because those books are meant for edification of the faithful, not for the establishing of sound doctrine. You see, there was a distinction between books. It was live. There, was, there were a set of books that all Christians everywhere had agreed upon for doctrine. And then there was another set of books that didn't have that same level of agreement and, and, and But, uh, except to this, that they were good for the edification of believers. Now, that, that's all before 1546, but that idea was looming large at Trent because they debated whether to actually keep a distinction between proto and what would become deuterocanonical books, okay? So that's very interesting to know. Eventually, that idea was thrown out. They decided, nope. We're going to have one long list of books, and there's going to be no distinction between them, okay? That eventually is decided, but it's debated amongst the fathers of Trent. The second uh, issue that they debate fiercely, and this actually has to come to a vote, is whether they're going to apply the term anathema to the one who, or that is accursed, right, to the one who doesn't accept this list of books. Mm. Apparently, this gets debated quite fiercely. It comes to a vote amongst the fathers, and you get uh, from one reckoning, and they're all close within one or two, but one reckoning of, of the Acts of Trent basically has it as a 25-4 and like a, like a 14 or 15 against the anathema, okay? It turns out, Gavin, that, that the Council of Florence, uh, which, was, which, which had met about 100 years before Trent, that became the precedent that Trent had to decide, like had, had to affirm. They couldn't actually change the list of books between Florence and Trent. Almost all the fathers were convinced they were going to accept that list of books. What they, what they were debating was, do we, make, do we make a distinction between books? And they decided, no, we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was, are we going to add an anathema? And they ultimately decided to add an anathema to the one who doesn't accept that list of books. I, I think it's after that time, after that move, that's really where, the, where you now have a Protestant and a Roman Catholic canon. I'm not saying they're creating themselves here. As I, I hope we've made it clear that this, this goes back centuries, both of these lists of books. But, what, but I do think the dust has now settled and the canonical boundaries for the Protestants and the Roman Catholics really hardened uh, 
uh, at 1546. In fact, I, I've done some more digging into this. If you look at um, John Calvin's uh, antidote to the decrees of Trent, which he published in 1547, one year later, Calvin notes immediately that Trent has decided to, to uh, paint all the books with the same chalk. That is, he noticed the distinction between books, between the, the, the Hebrew canon proto-canonical books and those deuterocanonical books that was, now find, that was now obliterated by Trent. But Calvin is a student of history. He knew that that distinction went back a long way and that Trent had now erased it, you see. Uh, and he also noticed that, um, yeah, they had, they had gone against the practice of the primitive church uh, in, in, uh, in doing what they did. So uh, with the anathema and, and other pieces. So, so yeah, I do, it's, it's fair to say, I think that Trent did introduce something new. It's the anathema, but I don't think that they created a new list of books. Mm -hmm. that, that's where I think uh, the caricature comes into play. So, um, so yeah, in one, on one hand, they were, you know, there was a bit of a counter-reformation move with the anathema, but they were affirming what they thought was right because of the Council of Florence's action 100 years prior. And they felt kind of constrained to, to, to just bring that list over pure and simple. Yeah, and, and the anathemas at Florence, if I understand correctly, were, had a slightly different focus to them, is that right? Yeah, so that's right. There is an anathematizing that's added to Florence, but my reading of Florence is it's actually that the canon list, the list of canonical books appears uh, in, in, a, in a decree against false Trinitarian views, in, in specifically uh, the view of Manichaeism, which held that the God of the Old Testament was different than the God of the New Testament. And so actually what, and it's a brilliant argument from the fathers at Florence, what they did is they said, no, 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 that's just not right. The same God is the God over the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament scriptures. But then when it comes down to, for the anathema, they basically say that those who would hold a different view of God, let this person be anathema. I, I don't think you have to read the anathema in Florence as applied specifically to the list of books, but at Trent, the you can't miss it. The anathema is super clear over the one who doesn't accept uh, this canon list of books. Okay, that's helpful. So final question here is on the whole, looking at, looking at everything, uh, what do you think the evidence supports in terms of which canon is the best or correct one? Yes, good. So, so Catholics uh, and, and Protestants in the 16th century can both find historical precedent for their view in the fourth century. The Protestants would cling to Jerome and the Roman Catholics would cling to say Augustine uh, and the Council of Hippo and those kinds of places, those kinds of documents. But the question is, when it came to the debate between Jerome and Augustine, how do we know, how could we know who was innovating by either adding books or taking away books, right? Something's happening between these two fathers. My thought is this, if we had evidence uh, from earlier Christians, say from the second and third century about what the books of the Old Testament were, would that become a, a, a comparative point for the action or for the list in the fourth century? I think so. So you go to the second century, we actually have two canon lists from the second century. They're known as the Bryennios list and, they're, and the list of Melito of Sardis. Both of those lists list only books related to the Hebrew canon, okay? There's a little bit of a debate about Melito where he, he refers to the book of Proverbs as wisdom, which is just another common title. Some have tried to say, no, 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 Melito included the book of wisdom in his list. And that's just so unlikely given everything else he says and everything else we know, the Proverbs of Solomon could also be called the, 
called wisdom in the second century. So I don't think there's really a debate there. But but um, the Bryennios list clearly includes no other books uh, of the Deuterocanon. So my thought is this, when, when Jerome and Augustine both make their claims that, that this is where precedent has left us, I do think Augustine had near-term precedent. There were churches in North Africa that had already been reading and accepting the deuterocanonical books for quite some time. So that by 397, when he writes his, down his list of books, he can say there's precedent. But Augustine's precedent doesn't go back very far. When Jerome says that Christians are reading only books tied to the Hebrew canon, I can actually demonstrate this from second century lists that only the books in the Hebrew canon are operative for, for the early church. Does that make sense? So that's one way I would try to cut the knot here uh, in terms of the fourth century debate is to say, well, on the whole, does Jerome have more evidence backing him or does Augustine have more evidence backing him? Just again, the way the evidence is, it comes down to us, Jerome's tradition can be established as far back as the first half of the second century AD, whereas Augustine's cannot. In fact, you're scraping and clawing to find citations of these deuterocanonical books from the second century. You, you just can't. You can find some allusions to them, but there are actually no citations to them, which shows that Christians did not really latch on to them until really the start of the third century, you see, and then you start to see how they might take more of a hold uh, in certain places. So I don't know if that helps, but that's, that's, that's why I think the Protestants are actually right, because their, their canon can go all the way back to the second century AD. Now I get it, the Roman Catholics are gonna say, yeah, that's fine, you got a couple of individuals in the second century, but, but look where the councils have gone, right? What's the conciliar trajectory? And they're gonna start at the Synod of Hippo, who, where there's a canon list that comes out of the Council of Hippo, that's then confirmed by the Council of Carthage, that then finally makes its way all the way to Florence and to, and to Trent. And I understand that argument. There's still a couple of questions I would like to ask my Catholic friends, though. Um, there is another synod of Laodicea, a council at Laodicea, which doesn't include any of the deuterocanonical books in it. So, but it is tied to the church's canon law by the time of the Council of Chalcedon. It's already added in but it doesn't include the deuterocanonical books. So what do we do with the Synod of Laodicea's canon list? The apostolic canons are also included in the church's canon law. But uh, in fact, some of the 16th century fathers that I, that I mentioned, they actually know it, at Trent itself, this comes up. Um, the, the apostolic canons specifically say that the book of Ecclesiasticus or the book of Sirach is not in the canon. Like it's, it explicitly says it's outside of the canon, but that document is also included in canon law. <laughs> so, so there are there, what I would perceive to be contradictions within some of the conciliar decrees and pieces found within canon law. It's not my expertise, it's not my specialty, but, but as I look at the pieces, I, I do wonder how uh, the Roman Catholic tradition and canon can kind of hold together, right? Whereas the Protestants don't depend on that. They're looking at what's the earliest tradition that most likely goes back to Jesus and the apostles, and that's the one they put forth as, as the canon. Uh, but again, Protestants aren't making a deep theological argument here. At least that's not how I read Martin Luther. I, I think they are simply saying that... Um, the, the canon of Jerome that reflects the Hebrew canon is an ancient tradition. And, and in fact, they were right about this. It's the only set of books that all Christians agree upon. It's the other books that are disputed and you can't build doctrine upon disputed books. So let's just build doctrine upon the books that all of us agree upon and that go furthest back. 
So that's that's why I think the Protestant view of the canon is correct. So. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, tell for for people watching this, tell us a little bit. How can our viewers learn more about you? And maybe do you want to mention anything about the book you're working on for Crossway with Peter Gurry? Oh yeah. So well, real quick, I'm on Twitter uh, at Dr. John Mead. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I I, I, I post there every now and again. Um, the book that I'm writing with Peter Gurry is, again, it, I, I, I write it with fear and intrepidation, Gavin. This is a book, uh, of, uh, another one of how we got the Bible. And uh, I, I, like, I like it because Peter Gurry is an expert in New Testament manuscripts and, and New Testament textual criticism. I bring a little bit of expertise on the Old Testament side and the canon side. But we're writing a whole book, a short book, so it should be for lay people or even freshmen at the university. How was the Bible written? How was the Bible's text copied? Again, like we've discussed here today, like how, how, were, how, was, how was the canon formed, right? So chapters both on the Old and New Testament. And then finally, what, what can we say about the history of translations, both ancient translations from say the New Testament period up through the Middle Ages to the Reformation, and then modern translations from the Reformation to, to today. So we really want to try to address everything, um, but there's not going to be a lot of footnotes. It's not going to be a great scholarly work, but I'm hoping it hits the major high points mm -hmm. and actually helps Christians and even honest seekers uh, come to see how, how we got the Bible. Wonderful. Yeah. Sounds like a really helpful book on a, on a, uh, at a more accessible level. What's the, what's the publication date, estimated publication date for that one? Yeah. So we'll, Lord willing, we'll turn the manuscript in by August 1st of this year, and then we should see it uh, in 2022. Okay, great. Hey, yeah. John, thank you again so much for your time. I think this has been really helpful for people on this issue. So thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Great. Thanks, Gavin. My pleasure.